Johnson, don't order. <laughs> Please. Please call her off. Zingy? Yes. Coos? Here. 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 Kiefer? Yes. Flora? Yes. Isom? Here. Gage? Here. Severson? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, that brings us down to communications. We've got um, keep you budget updates. Looks like one, two, three, four on the table. Um, that brings us to persons to be heard. Paul, do you want to start us off? Hello, I'm Paul Sear from E.C. Phillips and Son. Um, here to talk about water a little bit. Uh, we've been going, talking about it here for several years now. Um, I'll start off just talking a little bit about E.C. Phillips. Let me grab E.C. Phillips has been in business here in Ketchikan since 1926, approximately 90 years. We purchase all species of salmon, long line ground fish, dive fisheries, guyucks, sea cucumbers, shrimp, herring, bait herring, and uh, pretty much anything that's available to be purchased here in town year round. Uh, we also have a year-round cold storage that we store seafood products for sale locally and around the world. We're one of the few year-round private employers here in Ketchikan. We're considered a large employer under the Affordable Care Act, and we are held to those stipulations and standards and uh, have gone ahead and weathered that battle here over the last couple of years, along with some of the other things, you know, our 24% increase in water as well as annual substantial minimum wage increases and, and other things. We run about 120 employees for nine months of the year, and then for three months of the year, roughly 250 to 280 employees. That 120, that roughly 120 employees that are year-round um, folks are catch can residents, and they spend a lot of money here in catch can purchasing local things and doing local stuff. Uh, and E.C. Phillips, of course, supports all the local schools and charitable organizations and everything else year-round, as all other year-round businesses do here in catch can. Our water, our water usage, you know, with, within the 90 years we've been here in business, uh, our utility usage, and in particular, water, has been based on the supply and the cost. We know we use a lot of water, and, and our business requires it. Um, it's real important to seafood processing, and without it, without a lot of water, we, we can't process fish here in Ketchikan. And that's that's the, the reality of it. A um, Couple other quick facts about E.C. Phillips and, and water, where we use it, and we're the only company here in town that ices the fishing fleet year around. Uh, most of the other places shut down here for about three, four months, and then they're gone. We purchase seafood products from fishermen year-round as well, um, and we process seafood products here locally year-round. Um, that requires a lot of sanitation of our equipment, requires a lot of water for the equipment operation, and it also requires uh, freeze protection for a lot of our pipes and stuff. We have to, we've, we've gone ahead and a lot of pipes have been Isolated so that we can just dry them out, blow the water out. But there's a lot that we require to run some water through them to keep them from freezing up, especially when we're actively processing, as we are this week. You know, it's pretty cold out there. If we shut off the water, we, we can't completely drain the system every night and then bring in 70 people to fillet at 7 o'clock in the morning and have the system back up and running. So, so that be that running that water uses some water. Um, this business model has been in place for, you know, I, I don't know if it's been there for the whole 90 years, but I, I know it's been there since I've been around. 
And uh, we, since we've started talking to water, we, we have implemented a lot of conservation steps. We've uh, reduced our water usage. I, and I don't know exactly the numbers that we have reduced, but I'd like to get that from from Bob Newell when he has a chance. Um, I, everything I did in this, I've used the numbers that I had from 2013 and 14 when we when we decided on the three eight percent increases year after year. Um, so everybody at EC Phillips, all the employees know that we're trying to save water. People talk about it, shutting all, shutting all those off, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, we've invested some money in some equipment cooling and trying to do that without using as much water as we've had in the past. We've uh, gone through and coated some scuppers and drains so it doesn't require as much water to wash that debris away and trying to uh, trying to reduce our, our water footprint. Um, you know, before we do any other water increases, it's already more expensive to process fish and catch can than it is anywhere else. And it's obvious by the other fish processors here in town not processing their fish here. As a matter of fact, in the state, most fish processors take their fish out of here. I, we don't know of anybody else that does the same thing we do, where they keep the jobs in town and process that fish year around. When you go to, you know, Wrangell is shut down, it's a ghost town. They're not processing fish in any of the other southeast towns that they caught in the summertime and thawing it out and processing it. Um, for this reason, the majority of the fish purchased from in catch can from the catch can fishing fleet sent elsewhere. But EC Phillips prides itself on keeping those jobs here in catch can and processing that fish here in Alaska. But staying competitive is key for our fishermen and for our company to survive. I may be a little bit redundant here, but. When we met in 2013, we agreed on an 8% increase for three years. We talked about meter rates a little bit, and in talking with um, John Kliniger and Bob Newell and the couple of people that were involved, we talked about those meter rates, and it was determined that about 98% of the budget is fixed costs, and only 2% is variable in the water budget. So. It was obvious at that time to all involved, and there were letters written from the water department to the city council that said going to a meter rate isn't going to solve the problems for the budget. And we discussed that quite a bit. Um, so if the seafood processors eliminated water usage in Ketchikan or drastically reduce it, the water department's still going to have the budget shortfalls that they're faced with right now, and the jobs just won't be here. Um, so I, I took the information that I had from 2014 and the email, I got an email from Bob this afternoon and it, and it had some different rates that he was proposing. And I just ran some quick numbers on it and I, I wanted to share them with you. Um, Bob had recommended a 60% increase in the first year for the, the fish processors. Well, what that would do is uh, it would give E.C. Phillips and Son a 186% increase in our water rates. Trident would get a 13% decrease, and AGS will receive a 38% decrease in their water rates. Um, our water bill would go to about $12,000 a month. <coughs> Currently, we pay about $4,000 a month, which is roughly 100 times of any residential customer. But, I mean, it's a, we use a lot of water. I mean, there's no arguing that point. Um, again, Bob brought up in his email that we guys were looking at other water rates in, in other cities throughout Southeast and out throughout Alaska. But the thing to keep in mind is they're not doing that secondary processing that we're doing here in Ketchikan. What we're doing here to keep these jobs here is rather unique. And there's not a lot of people doing it. And I guess just to summarize, you know, through these few years of working with you guys on the water, um, it's become obvious to me anyway that there are tremendous economies of scale when it comes to delivering water. The fact that the fish processors use a lot of water makes them a really easy target for raising revenue. The vast amounts of water used <coughs> present kind of an illusion that we're being subsidized by other ratepayers. 
But the truth is that the water here in Ketchikan is falling from the sky for free. And once the pipes are already in place, it costs some money to maintain them, but it, it doesn't cost a lot more money to maintain those pipes for somebody that has 100,000 gallons of water or somebody that's taken a million gallons of water. The, the cost to do that maintenance isn't much different. And it only, I'd, I'd argue that the only thing that's different is the 2% of those variable costs that we talked about. The 90, other 98%, those fixed costs, those are there no matter what, whether that that 90%, 98% of the budget that's a fixed cost is gonna remain. So it's just that 2% of variable costs that change based on that water usage. And it feels like you guys are trying to recoup an all, awful lot more than the 2% difference um, through these water rate increases for the seafood processors. Um, and the, uh, the unfortunate thing is, is is if we end up doing this and, and we increase the rates to these crazy levels, I mean, you guys are gonna still have the same budget problems and we're going to have 120 less jobs in Ketchikan. So it's, uh, I, I don't know much more, what more I can say about it. And uh, that's that's what I got for right now. I'm sure I'll be up here talking again in the next meeting I'll, as I get more information from Bob and any questions that you guys have, I'm happy to discuss. So, Any questions for Paul? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, you... Are you still cooling your compressors with potable water? We are cooling our compressors with potable water partially. We've we've done some investment in reducing that, but it is not 100% under being worked right now. Okay. Any other questions? I just had a quick question. Do you also process seafood year-round in Craig? No, we just purchase in Craig. We don't ever process in Craig. All the fish from Craig comes to catch can, and we process all that fish here. Got it. Kennelly? Um, where do they send it when they, where are they sending it out of state to process when they don't process it? Well, they send it to Seattle. They send it to Asia. They send it to other parts of the world. They send some to other places. Specifically, I know a lot goes down to Seattle, though. A lot of fish is processed in Canada. Um, but uh, I don't know every place that they send it to. But I know that there is a lot Canada, Seattle, and in Asia. I also believe Trident, you know, and I don't know exactly what they process, but they got, they got plants in Georgia that they put up where they're processing fish. And I don't, I'm not sure if they're sending salmon down there to Georgia, where they can, where it's a bit more affordable to uh, to do some processing and to do some labor, or if it's primarily ground fish out of Akatan. But I know that they do send a lot of fish to Georgia to be processed. What makes it less expensive? Does the labor know? rates, cost of living, the water. <laughs> Thanks, you, Paul. I imagine we'll have more questions for you later. Okay. Not tonight, but maybe in the next, well, next few minutes. And are you, are you, will we be discussing water this evening? Um, if we get there, we'll be getting to the water. Um, I'm not sure. Probably t on Thursday. On Thursday? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. Anybody else want to address the council? Anybody else was signed up? See then we'll move back into the um, budget meeting. We left off in public, uh, or no, in uh, capital for the city. Uh, have some updates that we have to go through. Those, those, I think those are key to you, so we have to get to that one. Anything else on the capital for the city before we move into KPU? Yeah, Lou. Go ahead, I Dick. want to clarify something. Did we agree that the off-road vehicles that stored at the fire department that were used earlier are going to be used on the dock instead of buying a new one, or not? Carol, we've made arrangements uh, to view that vehicle. I think it's either tomorrow or Wednesday. Steve will be coming up. We'll take a look at it. We deem it appropriate. Uh, we'll bring back something to the council and we'll buy uh, the port. We're going to fire that, that vehicle from the fire department. 
department and there be some type of compensation for it? Okay, we'll see what you say. I still disagree that that's needed down there, but we'll see what you come up with. Thanks, Dick. Anybody else? Your Honor. Go ahead. H2. It's under the Civic Center. And it's in regards to the updated fire alarm system and requirements for the, I guess, alarm activated door stops. And I see here where the design for that is 60000 the actual construction is 50000 and the equipment, I guess, is going to be 100000 And I guess I'm not sure how this stuff is installed, but I know that we have the interior paint that we're doing in the same year. We have an HVAC system, and I don't know how many times we're going to tear up that building before we get everything done. So um, I just want, I guess I kind of like to know what the process is going to be for that project. Welcome. Alice Nelson, Civic Center Manager. Uh, our process is we need to bring in someone to evaluate our building and determine where we are going to need to change for fire code. We're determining it's going to be for the fire alarm system, and we're also wanting to evaluate the doors as we move forward because they are part of, obviously, the, the release and that we need to make sure that the doors are also to fire code. So our plan was to evaluate the building and see what the full scope is going to be in order to bring it up to fire code before we move forward. So um, I know that fire codes change, but a lot of time when you have commercial buildings and stuff, until you do a certain amount of work, you don't have to update to those. Is this a requirement or is it just something we're planning to do on our own, Carl? The uh, fire marshal has been through the building and has put us on notice that this is something that's got to be done. It's, it's not flexible on our part. Okay, I just checked it. So again, uh, we do have a number of different projects in 18. One of them is, the, I think, the interior paint. Mm -hmm. So that'll happen after all of this yes, is done. Yes, just so the sequence, absolutely. Well, yeah, and I don't know where the HVAC system is, or if that even plays into it. That was in 2017, so it would be before that. Okay. Any other questions for Alice? Jelly? What exactly will the fire doors do that it's different from what they do now? Right now, our doors, we prop them open with those door stops that you might have seen here at the Civic Center. What they are is they would actually release if the fire alarm is triggered, and it would just be a magnetic door. So if the alarm system goes off, it just releases the doors so that they close. I have another question. Mm -hmm. You have a room full of 300 people, and you're going to let the door slam shut and lock them in the middle of the building. How is that up to code? <laughs> I'm Good sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am just like saying that people are going to need to get out. Right. I, I don't understand why we would. Here comes Mr. Hilson to answer that question. <laughs> Mark, Mark Hilson, Public Works Director. My understanding of these doors are that they have panic hardware on them, so they do spring open. It's just to control smoke and fire. So they still open, uh, but when the alarm is tripped, they close. So, like fire doors in a hotel or something? Yes. Lock them up. Okay. Exactly. Dick? And it costs sixty thousand dollars to evaluate it, and one hundred fifty thousand dollars to fix the magnetic doors. I mean, you didn't do that. Somebody else gave you that number. I know. <laughs> that I'm was the estimate I got. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anything else for Alice? Thank you, Alice. At this time. Okay, we're still on public works. which is the Dunton Street trestle project. And it looks like we're proposing that we're going to get a state grant. And the reality of that may be, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we have those monies in place yet or not. Um, but I know that we had a bunch of underpinning work, but I'm sure the deck does. Does a the, does the complete bridge need to be replaced, or is, can it be refurbished? 
as it is because we put some money into the underpinning with uh, pool engineering and after talking to a truck in the past it seems like the underpinning is uh, I think in place and in good shape right now uh, good evening council Seth Brackey assistant public works director uh, so this project the Dunn Street trestle is for replacement uh, the bridge is currently on the state transportation improvement program, the STIP. So this would only occur if we, if those state funds uh, became available. The one nice thing about, um, even given our state budget crisis, there's still federal money that comes in that uh, the state uses to pass through via the STIP. So the bridge programs one. I guess bright spot you could say in the DOT funding. So it's held separate than the, the road work. Yeah. It is, and this was one of the two structures that we opted not to put on the borough list that they were gathering for mm -hmm. potential leftover money from the airport project. Uh, it was agreed at that time since it was on the step and the state was moving in to design, but the odds of getting state funding for that project were pretty good. That's good. Um, one of the things I noticed in this project is that it's, it proposed state grants about 80%, and on L14, we're looking at uh, sales and gorge and the state participation in that one, uh, it looks like it's only 33%, and I, I didn't know why the difference in, in percentages. There was a mistake made in identifying the funding sources for some of those projects. We will be seeing that the budget update, but I think there's four or five projects that we modified the funding. It should be 90% grant funded and 10% local mass. We did that update today, and it will be coming to you for the meeting on Thursday. Yeah, and I think I talked to Bob about L15 and the fact that it shows that all the public work sales tax is going to be spent on the street park after. You're absolutely right. So, thank you. Judy. On J2. J2. It says dangerous building abatement foreclosed. This is, it says there's numerous buildings demolished within the city. Um, so this is abatement. Explain to me. Abatement, are we taking them down? Um, yes, Public Works Director Mark Hilson. Abatement can be uh, complete demolish. Right. It could also mean um, if there is a dangerous building that uh, needs something that comes into the how ownership of this city. We, how many do we have? We give you a list and try to get it to you quarterly. There's probably 20, yeah, 20 to say. 30 that we now have control over. I thought we... Is this different than... All the ones we sold. We have new ones and we'll probably read every day. So these things become tax delinquent and then through the process the city somehow ends up with them. Is the bank involved in any of these houses? Has a lien holder on them? Um, we, we have involved uh, banks when they get on our derelict building list to try to get the bank to, uh, you know, bear the cost of securing the building or making certain rudimentary upgrades. Um, so occasionally a bank is involved. Uh, I would not say it's normal for the bank to be involved. Most of these buildings aren't mortgaged. Okay. Anybody else on public works? Uh, you know, okay. Is, is there in the any fun, um, grant funding for, like, I know some of these homes are probably elderly people. Is there any programs on those, um, on the HUD programs that, are, that have been coming in for just maybe helping people out fix some of those? I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not, I, KIC. There were several state programs, but those have all been pretty much defunded in the last five to ten years. There are some KIC. There's some new ones, yeah. I think, that just came up on the HUD, mm -hmm. just from the, the homeless 
um, thing I went to, they, 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 but I believe there's going to be more federal funding coming back. Uh, for, I mean, just keep your hands on Yeah, I know. <laughs> Bob? Um, L22, Mark, it shows that you guys are looking at doing some improvements to the retaining wall on 2nd Avenue. And you talk about it being in conjunction with a water and sewer project, but I don't see it in the wastewater uh, capital project list. Um, you're saying, you know, going to start engineering 218, and that's going to coincide with some of the stuff that's going on with water and sewer improvements. And then it'll be in 2020, but um, I don't see anything matching in wastewater. Because it was taken out of water and wastewater for lack of funds. Um, you know, given the council's directive of uh, putting a hold on rate increases, uh, when I went through water and sewer, that was the only way I could get the budget to balance. Okay, and this would have been a contract service, but it, uh, if we're going to open up that section of road, is that something that we potentially can do in-house, Mark, to be in, a project? In terms of the utility replacement, yeah. we would, we are evaluating all our projects to see which ones are suitable for in-house. So it's, it's a possibility. I'm not going to promise that, but we are, it, as, as a standard, we are looking at all of these type of projects to see if it's appropriate to try to do in-house. And just as a comment, one of the things I see under here is we're replacing equipment. Um, some of it's fairly old, but uh, some of it has very low hours and, and time due to the type of use it gets. But I still go back to the fact that we store this equipment outside or in the weather, and it, it really deteriorates fast. And when you read stuff on fleet management, if you were to put in a decent fleet storage facility, it would, it's a third the cost, if not a quarter of the cost of replacing your fleet on a repeat basis because it's out of the weather. So I really think that at some point we should be looking at what we can do to, to do that because we, we invest millions of dollars in equipment and uh, I just hate to see it. I, I see the same thing in telecom and other places. When it sits outside, we're throwing our money away or a portion of it. Thank you. Anything else on capital? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Yes. I noticed that on N2 we're going to be relooking at the uh, HVAC system here in, um, I think this one's for City Hall, and we're going to be using Marine Associates. Have we used this company before? Yes, we have. Okay. Uh, with good results. With good results. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, and they came uh, recommended by uh, one of our local contractors. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure that, I mean, it, there's all kinds of contractors out there. This is such an old building and it has so much so chopped up that I know it's hard to balance it, and that's what the biggest problem we're having here. Thank you. <laughs> and the same thing along that vehicle stuff, we're going to be looking at putting a pole building up at the salt waste facility. Yes. And we're going to engineer that and try to build as much of it in-house. Is it going to be designed in such a way that it will completely enclose in concrete floor at some point in the future? Uh, yeah, concrete floor and completely enclosed. Um, that is the plan. That like gets expensive, so it will be a multi-year project. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Read that, I'll ask the last question. Have we done anything on Elliott Street stairs yet? 
we were talking about doing some change in that. And Mrs. Young up there really wants to make sure that she knows what we're doing before. She's the one that uses them there from the top. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm going to defer to Seth because okay. he's got an update on that. Thanks, Seth. Sure. So I've, I've spoken with Mrs. Young. And uh, so the Elliott Street stairs, a portion, the upper run will be replaced as part of the DOT uh, Water Street bridge project. So it's just the upper run, which is up above her residence. Um, so they'll be replaced with wooden tread. And the DOT design had a kind of a chicken wire mesh that got nailed down or stapled down. Um, and it's our intent to request that we omit the, that chicken wire and just go with our regular uh, um, roofing paper that we use in other stairs. Thank that you. should take care of the complaint or question. Yeah. Where was the chicken wire? Thank you for dealing with that, so, boss. So, Seth, um, what is, the, is that? Is that like a five foot stairway up there or something like that? It's not very. For width, yeah. Yeah, so we have some contractual service money that we haven't really used. Would it be advantageous to change that to the open grate like we're doing on a number of the other stairs at this time? Could we incorporate that into that project so we don't have to come back and do it later? Well, that's the, that's her fear because she's worried she's going to fall on the great things. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it is that her can um, similar to what we did on yeah. um, going up the Bayview. Mm -hmm. Did we do yeah. something yeah. on that different? That was Edmonds. She used, put the metal. She uses a cane and stuff, and she's really concerned about the open grade. And so as long as they're just replacing on the upper thing and it was just a wood, it should be fine. Or it won't go by her house. The open nope. grade? Yeah, see, the, uh, oh. if, if they were to work on the upper section where they're talking oh, about. Okay. I yeah. thought you were talking about the whole thing. No, no. Oh, yeah. But if they're going to do that at, at this particular time, I don't I don't know if it, what the cost would be to substitute the open grate for the wooden tread if they're going to do the replacement anyway. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, at, at this time, it's under contract between DOT and, and Dawson Construction. So I can certainly propose it um, and see what they say. Uh, but in talking with uh, Mrs. Young, she was pretty anti-metal tread in any location. Yes? Um, I would advise against it because I use a cane and I went up all the stairs. And in Inman Street, those treads were, and they get slippery. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they were harder because your feet, your shoes actually catch on the, the little grates, and so you, I actually tripped up the in mist. <laughs> the wood with the, I didn't see any chicken wire on it, that particular Elliott Street, though, but I know that one of the um, railings was loose, just a little bit, like you could feel it and it moved. You know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. It's just too easy to trip on or um, catch, catch, catch yourself on those. Yeah. Seth, thanks for your work. All right, since we have nothing else on the capital, um, do we have to defer the on um, that, but um, now the city budget and so we can make a motion. I so claim it. So let's go over to. Um, New Business 6A Resolution 162646, adopting the budget for 2017, appropriate, uh, appropriating from the Ketchikan Public Utilities Enterprise Fund for fiscal year 2017. We have um, on A1, we have a resolution. We, uh, we, we have the resolution. With, if somebody could make a motion to approve that resolution. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, just, you can just read the top. Top of A1. Oh, okay. I move to adopt a resolution uh, budget for the year 217 appropriated from the Ketchikan Public Utilities Enterprise Fund for the physical year 217 and establish an effective date. Second. Moved and second. Carl, we'll let you lead it off. 
Very briefly, Mr. Mayor, and similar to the general government budget, the proposed budget for 2017 for KPU represents a status quo of spending plan. Current levels of services are maintained as our staffing, with the exception of one customer service representative position that's proposed to be added to the sales, marketing, and customer service division to assist with the sale of Verizon services and product, products. For a previous city council discussion, no general government utility rate increases have been programmed and the proposed budget has been structured. Pursuant to previous city council direction of maintaining KPU utility rates at their, at their current levels. Uh, while the spending plan is essentially balanced, there are a number of assumptions that we would uh, require city council concurrence all, or alternative direction. First, as a result of collective bargaining agreements that are in place, a 2.5% cost of living adjustment in 2017 has been programmed for employees represented by IBEW Local 1547. A 2% salary increase has been budgeted for non-represented employees as well. The negotiations for a new collective bargaining agreement that will go into effect January 1 of 2018 are expected to begin in July. Second, while water rates are programmed to remain flat, the only means to accomplish this goal was to severely curtail capital spending. As with wastewater rates, the water division lacks the financial resources to fund both operations and urgently uh, required infrastructure replacement. That fact was again demonstrated by FCS at your budget deliberation session of December 5th, and it is staff's hope that you'll take their recommendations to heart, uh, and to that end, we've offered uh, a proposed motion for this evening that would raise water rates 5.5% for most users, and establish a rate of 60 cents per thousand gallons for seafood processors. Uh, and if I can comment on that just for a moment would like to dispel anybody believing that your costs within the water division are fixed. Uh, between federal and state mandates and deteriorating infrastructure that is literally crumbling in the ground, your costs are going to be increasing exponentially. And, and to, to claim that they're fixed just is not an accurate picture of reality. One of the recommendations that we brought forth in next year's spending plan is a uh, proposal to create what we're calling a facilities and infrastructure investment fund. The proposed appropriation for 2017 is minimal, only $250,000. But what we're trying to model it on is the Community Facilities Development Fund that was established several years ago in general government. And wise investment in that fund allowed the city to move forward with capital investments at the library uh, and the fire station and the museum. The capital need in KPU is just as great, if not greater than general government, not only in terms of aging infrastructure underground and along the streets, the facilities at the water and electric divisions as well. Um, just as Public Works is in desperate need of a new warehouse, so is the electric division and, and the water division is not far behind. Last point I would make uh, is what we said with the general government budget. State of Alaska is going to continue to grapple with its fiscal plight. In doing so, uh, the, the capital investment that we used to be able to get from the state in terms of grants and lowest interest loans, that's going to continue to decrease, putting a larger uh, burden on local ratepayers to fund what we're going to have to do over the next several years. This isn't new investment I'm talking about, like Whitman Lake or Two Point Chlorination. I'm talking about the old water mains, the deteriorating power poles, 
and everything else in between. It's an old, they're old systems and they're going to have to be dealt with no different than what you're, you're looking at on the general government side. Essentially, that's it, Mr. Mayor. We laid uh, four budget updates on the table this evening. Um, Bob and I are, are looking forward to getting, getting through it. Thank you, Carl. Um, and I understand the, um, you know, we're all under um, budget crunches and um, from the, probably got to be from the federal to the state here, and we got to, you know, determine what um, our rate payers can afford at this time. We raised electric rates 5% last year. Um, I understand the direness of everything, and I will try to do what we can, and like we did those projects where we um, just got going um, um, this year, you know, we're looking at things, and I think um, we're not going to be able to do everything, and all the money isn't going to be there anymore to do it. So we're going to have to be very selective and think of other ways. And we have that um, one um, bond paying off at 1.6 million or whatever we pay a year on that. Um, you know, is there a way we can come up with a plan to utilize that to do some more bonding and see what the local, I mean, locals would like to? Um, us to do and how much. I mean, I am, um, and I'm not going to, I mean, we're going to have to be very uh, stingy because I'm not going to just dump this all on back of the type of the rate payers. Um, you know, we're taking care of our employees for another 800000 this year. Um, and we're, we want to take care of our rate payers too. And um, the only good news I know of, of lately is that um, power sales are up. So maybe we'll get a little more money. Um, it is going to be t um, tight, and we're going to have to balance it. But um, I am um, not going to be quick to jump at um, rates. All the time. And that's just my comment. All right, anybody? Um, we are on um, the transmittal B one through through B seventeen, and I'm on page four. Um, and uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had a note here, and I don't know for sure what it's for. Your Honor. Go ahead. Yeah, and the bottom of B4, they talk about the rate comparison to U.S. average, and I don't know how fair that comparison is because most utilities have, a, have to purchase their power. They may own a utility and, and provide line services and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know how we match up against those, and I just just wanted to throw that out there. I have no, uh, I know that we have a, a, a rate structure based on uh, our needs, and it needs to go up some. But uh, I, I don't know if it's a fair comparison to look at what other communities down south are doing without the hydro and, and having to buy, I guess, power on the market. Just a thought. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. We can get into the other stuff when we get into the detailed budget things, I guess. Individual budgets. Yeah. Anybody has a question on anything on the thing? I, I mean, he has his budget notes. <laughs> um, the discount, I was a little um, sorry to see you um, channeling that out. Um, does, doesn't that help in our marketing of our telecommunications? Carl? I'd like to see it on my bill every year. Every <laughs> <time>. <laughs> it's a positive, Mr. Mayor, but quite candidly, if the council is going to maintain rates at their current levels, it's, it's, it's not something we can afford. Excuse me. B11, we talk about um, some of the increased stuff, and we put the SEPA true up account under supplies. I guess I don't really understand why it went under supplies. And then that's going to uh, that's going to raise the operating cost of the division. And and uh, one of the things that we have to remember is we seem to run Whitman. 
uh, which triggers that true up account. If we didn't run Whitman, we wouldn't have any true up. So when we're long on water, I don't know if it makes sense to run it flat out. I mean, just I don't know if we're making money on it. If, if we have to make the true up at 6.8 cents, we're probably making a penny on it. Whereas if we're running one of ours, we're making more. So I don't know if we're making money doing that or not. I, you know, that's just the dynamics of it. I don't know, Carl. Yeah. Andy, do you want to address that? Andy Donato, uh, electric division manager. Uh, to answer that question, um, now that we have Whitman operational, now that we've seen some couple of hydro hydrological seasons, uh, we basically just run the large unit uh, just for spill mitigation. The small unit we run uh, basically to satisfy the, the needs of the hatchery. Uh, and uh, the beauty of the whole thing is we end up saving water for the entire SEPA system. Um, and so right now, for instance, this is a, a, a very strategic period. We've got this snap of cold weather. We're going through water like you wouldn't believe. And uh, that little unit runs 24-7. Uh, it did trip off Friday evening after our Christmas party. We dispatched some people, got it running again. That's how important it was to us. We didn't want to leave it off till, 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 uh, uh, till Monday. Uh, so anyway, it's very important, but we don't, we don't generate a lot out of it. We don't use it. Uh, to its maximum just for that same reason, but uh, strategically it fits in well in, in, in the hydrological profile and saving water across the whole area. We're talking about instead of firing up a diesel, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, these next couple of days we're really going through a lot of water. Rather than fire up a diesel, we'll fire up unit one uh, and, and, uh, and use it that way. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, it's very important to us at this time of the year. Yeah, and I, and I remember that when we first started talking about Whitman, it was for diesel mitigation you know, to keep us out of burning diesel. And so it's a long-term management. You probably don't do that right at the state that you need diesel. But have we had enough experiences to say that we could run our other facilities and maybe even if we have a little bit of spill out of Whitman to reduce the operating costs of having to pay CEPA a true up? Does it make got it just about to the minimal. Okay. Right. So if you look at that, I think we make uh, somewhere's on the order of uh, 500 or so uh, megawatt hours a month, and it's just out of the little unit. We come out somewhere's around maybe eight gigawatt hours through the year out of Whitman, and that's about as low as we want to keep it. We use it strategically to stretch our water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I just didn't know how we were working out on that now that we have some experience with it. Thank you, Andy. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on the okay. east section? I guess. Why didn't we put it in supplies? It's a purchase power, and I don't know if that's a supply. Bob? <laughs> I know we had to put it someplace. But. We kind of debated that back and forth. It would either contract services or supplies, and since there was something for resale, we considered it to be a uh, I guess a tangible item that we're reselling to our customers, that, that would be a supply. But you can make an argument both ways. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Would you counsel social? Yeah, please. Can't be 15, Carl. You know, we have the, the Series T bond that pays out the 1.1 million payment, I guess, for the final portion. Um, when that comes back, are you, is that something, what are you looking for on that for the following year? Utilizing those funds to do some more bonding? Did you have any ideas of what you'd like to do? Or? My initial thoughts, Mr. Mayor, would be to take a portion of that equivalent payment and have the council invest it in the, the new fund that I was referring to earlier. Okay. And have that money set aside for infrastructure replacement when we start identifying that in, in the upcoming years. Um, when you get to the budget this time next year, uh, you will have a new collective bargaining agreement that's going to have to be negotiated. Um, that will come into play as well. Uh, I would not want to see that entire equivalent amount just go to regular o and I'd, I'd like to try to get it invested in a, in a hard, tangible asset, be it an infrastructure project, or just putting it away for future capital investment. That would be my recommendation. Right. 
Thank you. Anybody else on the bees? Let's go into summaries. Will disappoint a Carl. I was hoping to come back at ten million again to start the year. <laughs> what is others in revenue? Carl? It's consistent numbers. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What's the other? Like the other Revenue is others after water. 40,000. I'm sorry, what page are you on? C1. 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 Uh -huh. The other revenue is um, interest income and um, a filling and collection uh, fee that we collect from general government for doing uh, wastewater and garbage filling. Yeah. I, a question, Bob. You provided us with a, a number three update today that uh, showed that in 2015 we turned back into reserves $2.5 million that wasn't spent. Now, assuming some of that's going to happen from 16 to 17, is the number of reserves at the beginning of 2017 on C1, that will be increased by what we don't spend in 16, and in a couple of months you'll roll it into it? Right, that's, that's correct. Whatever, whatever we don't spend of our appropriation to 2016 will last. If it hasn't been encumbered, it will be returned to the reserve to the KPU Enterprise Fund. Okay. Thank you. Anything on C's? We got C2. Play schedule on C3. Two more revenue, right? <laughs> Debt credit service on C6. C7. You can see on C7 that that uh, one T-bond is done after this year, and then our next one will mature on 2022. Okay, revenues, D1. This one's electric. Again, I see that sales are up, so I'm expecting our revenue numbers to hopefully show some reflection in that. Or our sales are up. Because of the dry or cold weather. Yes, Jenny. I know that we run out our poles. Is it possible to even raise some of that rate, or is that a set? Why don't we negotiate a couple of years each time? The pole rental? It's, it's governed by uh, federal and state statute, what we can we can charge for reimbursement for that. That's what I wonder. <laughs> can I assume we're charging the maximum? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Out of curiosity, it's tangent here. Um, DOT is finally putting in more lights out the road. We we're paying for the, for, the, for the juice on those, or who's paying for the juice on those? We had this discussion the other day. It's a combination. Some they pay completely for. There are a limited number that we pay for because uh, they funded the infrastructure when it was put in. And that, that number is really minimal. Mm -hmm. 
and it looks like um, contrary to the line that DOT has been towing for several years, they're not going to start to allow us to put LED lights along the highway, which should save a significant amount of money and maintenance. Uh, and so the new ones go in with a metered system on them, don't they? Yeah. For street lights, I believe. Mark Adams, KP Electric Operations Manager. So the uh, the new lighting circuits that they're putting on North Tongass are going to be metered. There's going to be 10 metered load centers, um, and they'll tie in the existing steel street lights that they have on North Tongass into those new systems. So after that, we'll only have a handful, maybe half a dozen um, DOT lights out on South Tongass that aren't directly metered. And then the lights up on 3rd Avenue actually still are metered and paid for by the state yeah. also. How are we doing on South Tongass? On South Tongass, as far as the is that just a per pole or per light charge there? Do we do we by watts or something? We I, I'm not sure how those six lights, six or seven lights or so that they put in around Buggy's Beach and, and around the Fawn Mountain area, how those ones are being accounted for. Thanks, Mark. All right. Anything else on the D's? We can go to KPU Administration E1. Nothing on that. We have um, sales and marketing, customer service, F1. That's where we'll see the one increase in personnel. Yeah, Your Honor. Go ahead. So I guess I just asked a little justification on that. I don't know what the what the business is as it comes in through the door that requiring an extra customer service rep for that. I just want to make sure it's clear. Kim Simpson, Division Manager, Sales, Marketing, and Customer Service. Um, we currently have an interesting staff in Sales, Marketing, and Customer Service. I actually have a complete billing staff and a complete credit staff, in addition to people that actually sell. There's really only five people who are dedicated to selling. This would add a sixth person. And in terms of um, the Verizon, it's a little different than it is with the regular sales. What the staff does is they'll, with the regular telecom sales or with electric, you sit down, you have a conversation, you sign them up, orders get entered. Um, the provisioning and all the install work is done outside the customer service department. And uh, what is happening now on the Verizon side is that we don't just sell a device, we also have to provision it transfer all the data, all the contacts over, as well as troubleshoot when people go and reset their settings. And there are occasionally, um, about two to three times a week, we get a customer in that will be there from two hours to four and a half hours. Well, we help them troubleshoot and to have a staff person. I assist whenever I can, I'm, but I cannot always be there and I'm, I can't always spend all that time with the customer. So occasionally we need to do that and um, we'd also, you know, don't, we also get about 200 to 250 calls a day. What's been happening is when we have somebody tied up, we can't always get to the phones. And everybody answers the calls, and we always return the calls. But it's just to maintain the current level of customer service and then also um, provide the hands-on. Um, most people come to expect KPU to provide a little more in terms of customer service. So when somebody does have a problem with their Verizon phone, we really don't like to turn them away. I can have them call support, but that's really the, and currently I am down a number of people. I've got a person out on uh, workers' comp, and so that is an entire body that's not there. I have a staff person that's pulled over um, now full-time running the billing system. You also have some remodeling going on in the front office there. Yeah, my intent is to take that big wall, that big front wall out, and put in three freestanding areas. That'll allow a number of things. I can have a person that would be working the Verizon area 
be manning a regular desk that has the regular computer systems. The Verizon systems have to be kept separate, but that way they would be adjacent to the Verizon area and it will allow um, basically three freestanding desks at the front. And when people have to have bills explained to them then, instead of this wall where we're trying to talk over the wall, they can actually get a customer right next to them and explain the bill a little easier. I think it'll help with the flow. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with a question on um, customer service, sales, and marketing? Seeing that, let's go to electric. Your Honor? Yep. Kim, on 51002 is operating supplies and equipment. Um, what, what terabytes are you buying? <laughs> um, that is that is our uh, storage method for the video content that we um, that we film. We we store that on terabytes. Okay, and is that something you buy online in store, them, or is it something we have in? We buy we purchase them locally. We usually get them through TBC. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jenny. Just on a positive note. So how how well is? Verizon done since um, We've done very well with Verizon. We're counted among the top stores actually in Alaska. I, I, um, I can share numbers. I would prefer not to share them completely publicly. But, but um, they're very, very pleased with our performance. We're being used as a model actually across the country now. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you made a comment about you get about 250 calls a day. What's the bulk of those calls about? Oh, it could be almost anything. A lot of people like to call in and make payments, but people call in with a question, um, question about service, question about adding, um, really almost anything you could imagine. Uh, um, they see the number. I had somebody that was looking to buy a house locally, looking for repossessed property. They, that call came through the system. They funnel all those type usually to me. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a, occasionally there will be trouble calls um, also, and we've got a customer support person that sits down there, so we'll send the calls then over to them. We actually have a complete log of every call. Mm -hmm. I call him for everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's always losing stuff. He's <laughs> what's, what's Kim's phone number? <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. You just like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kim. All right, we're in electric. Honor? Yes. Yeah. Um, G3 under customer service, they install 14 new electrical services. Is that? I mean, we actually went out and installed them, or is that something? I mean, how does that work? <laughs> I don't know. Is that Mark? Or is that Andy? a Mark question? Find out where you're at. Yeah. G3. 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 Under customer service. Is that something we install on our own properties? I don't, I don't know. I, I believe that's actually probably a reference to the commercial loads, larger customers. Well, it's not the it's not a it's not a tally of necessarily new customers on Okay, I just I, I didn't know where we were installing. I mean, usually we we make the hookups. No, and, and with uh, with commercial customers, customers, cu excuse me, customers and whatnot, we're installing and bringing in. Uh, the CT metering uh, that's that's required for uh, certain certain loads like commercial and whatnot. It's different than just the, than just the meter itself. So the meter shop's involved more directly with those. Okay. Okay. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't understand how that happened. Sure. Thank you. Anything on electric? So, uh, Your Honor, what? Um, I guess at G8 under uh, 64501, I see we're spending another 7,000, you know, a little over 
uh, you know, 40% or something like that on rents and leases. How much space are we renting? What are, is that for pole storage, or do we rent dry space in somebody else's warehouse, Andy? Do you know? Not a big item, but at some point it becomes obvious that we maybe should have our own storage facility if that's the case. <laughs> Andy did not have an electric condition mention. I'm with you on that. Uh, but right now we've got, I think, three places that we're storing, keeping our stuff at, trying to keep it dry. Um, so we've got a spot, and including uh, in addition to that, a pole yard. Yeah. So I think we've got some space in Saxman that we're using, uh, someplace right across from Bailey. Yeah, at some place, those, those costs go up to where we can probably afford to make payments and build in our own facility, wherever that may be. But Although I think the Saxman is really reasonable. Okay. Small. Okay. Still on electric. Um, I guess you know, one of the things is, is through uh, the request from Councilmember Coos and talking about the uh, different. Uh, carryovers. It looks like we're carrying over a million two in the electrical division, which is probably about seven four seven point four percent of their overall budget. Um, and some of that is, if you look through the performance schedules and stuff, we're not utilizing some of the accounts to full extent. Just one that jumps out is the uh, education or the training. It's at forty nine percent. So you budget eighty thousand, you use forty some thousand, we leave thirty nine thousand hanging. Um, now, just going forward, as we look at rates, we got to make sure that we get those numbers close to actual use um, instead of, I think, uh, putting that larger cushion in or not understanding. If you have to come back for more money, that, that's one thing. But uh, the, like I said before, we're dealing with other people's money. We want to make sure that we, we keep our accounts as close as possible. So turning back 7% uh, of your budget, um, I don't know how we take that out but that's something we should consider moving forward so we did that exactly in that in that in that budget category right so we knocked out 40 40 percent out of uh, training yeah okay thank you anything else on electric i'm curious um Stevenson said something earlier about running running without sepa so, did you mean like, could we run our whole electric system without no. CEPA? No. <laughs> okay. just to give you some, just no, sure, but to give you some order of magnitude, um, we're very close to 50 50. We can argue the minor percentage points, but we can supply about 50% of our own needs. The other 50% has to come from CEPA, the way the power sales agreement is written, uh, they're the only source that we can use, right? It's, uh, yeah. So they, they provide whatever is left to call the firm power requirement. But we can get very close to 50% of our own. And that's all hydro? It's all hydro, yeah. And if you look over the years, um, and you include the diesel in, it comes out that 98% of our generation is hydro. So just a very small percent is diesel for emergencies, backup state, things like that, just to give you some perspective. Anything else on electric? Yeah, Lou. Yes. Uh, G13. Uh, the question is, I, at the top of the page, it shows uh, this is under capital. All three line items, the estimated expenditure is considerably less than what was budgeted for, and we brought it back up. But we spent less than half what we budgeted for. I assume some of those may be carried over. I can't tell from down below what kind of things are being carried over, but I assume some of them are carried over. Council Member Coos? Yes. This is on page G13. G13. It says major capital projects. It's the first thing at the top. And it's got uh, three line items, 70, 720, 725, and 730. And um, yeah, the first line item, yeah, you're within 50 grand of what was spent, but the other one you spent uh, 
175 out of 1.2 million, and we've spent 970 thousand out of 16 1.6 million. And if you take the bottom line, the total down at the bottom says total major capital outlay. We spent 1.4 million versus we were budgeted for a little over three. But the budget is backed up to three for 17. They try hard, but they don't get them all done. Well, I know what we'll do with it. We'll put it in this capital account that Carl wants. We'll take half of everything rolled over. We'll put it in a half capital account. That way we'll get hit. Mm -hmm. It just keeps going into that fund balance. <laughs> that way they'll be buying the carpet again every, every fiscal year on the state. Now we'll get the two capital projects. So to answer some of that question, uh, the, uh, the amount that we have spent and the estimate is somewhat of a snapshot in time. So I don't know if that takes us into the most recent activity. I don't know that the date of that. Yeah, and, and I know, I'm sure some of those projects will roll over, and, that, and that's okay. That's just kind of what. Uh, I'd like to just add a couple of comments that might help make this a little bit more clear. When you're looking at the 2015 adopted budget, Capital outlay, major capital outlay, you're looking at about 3.2 million. That would be adopted budget. And that budget which we do, many budgets would provide about 3 million. The estimate is 1,419,000. What that estimate represents is actual cost for what we have spent, plus purchase orders that we have issued that we have not actually paid for yet. Okay, so that balance leaves about one point, uh, comparing it to the adopted budget, you're looking at about $1.7 million is going back into the reserve to KPU. Now, if you can turn to page C1 in the capital budget portion, C1. C1? C, C, C as in Canada. C. C. Okay. And what you've got there is the summary page for the electric division CIP. And if you look in the one, two, the third column from the left, you see a reappropriated column. And down at the bottom is 985,000. So what that means is that of the you see that 985 down at the bottom. Okay, going back to the page we were just talking about, there's $1.7 million went back into reserve. Of that $1.7 million, we reappropriated $985,000. So what's left in reserve is the difference between the $1.7 and the $985,000. Thanks, Bob. I didn't confuse you. No. <laughs> that answered pretty much what we're, we're already pre confused. You're, you're doing <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more electric questions? Uh, Go ahead, Bob. Andy, I don't see a diesel on here. Are we moving towards uh, having to purchase a new diesel in the, in the future here? <laughs> you sure that's smart. Yeah, those are pretty expensive items. I don't know if we should start planning for it earlier. That's a very good question. I don't think I can answer that for you here tonight. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we have talked internally. You know how we call our diesels at Bailey? We call them uh, BAG, Bailey, you know, bag one, bag two, bag three. So we have, we've already talked about a proposed bag five and a location for the proposed bag five. So if I could just plant the seed tonight, that's great with yeah. your question. And uh, so, so that may be a good place to put in Ward Cove. And it may be a good item to make it dual fueled, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be diesel. Maybe if the economy uh, favors uh, um, LPG or, or something like that uh, in the future, it could be dual fueled and available at a deep water port where the fuel fuel can get there. Just some of the things you toss around, right? To be as flexible as possible if you're looking that way in the future. Uh, well, I just think that if, if we're going to do that, and I, and I can, I know that what we've got is fairly old infrastructure, and um, 
we should start planning for that early on in case we want to put in some kind of an investment account to start building a fund for that. I don't know what that'll cost. But. At one time, there was a, I call them tire kickers for lack of a better term, but we've had tire kickers come through thinking that they're going to put uh, uh, natural gas, not natural gas, uh, um, help. Yeah, liquid, liquid yeah, natural energy yeah, yeah. yeah. um, through the city here, right? <laughs> and uh, where would they start? We thought, well, maybe Ward Cove would be a good place for a deep water port, put some kind of a plant there, et cetera. And uh, they actually thought, uh, looking at economies of scale, trying to roll everything together to get the whole picture, well, they even consider helping us finance back five. <laughs> so, uh, so those are things to look at, right, before we go jump into that. Thank you, Andy. Sure. Thank you. Hope that answered your question. We did. No. All right. Anything else? I'm ready for a um, telephone. Uh, telecommunications. Let's go to telecommunications starting at H1 through H17. Just one question going back yeah. to electrical. I see our telecommunication charge for the electrical division is $150,000. What does that What does that get us? What are we paying for? I mean, that, that seems like an awful lot of money to be paying ourselves, of course. What's that? To be paying ourselves, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so we do. Intergovernmental transfers. Let's see where we're going. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking for the page two, Andy, but I, I remember that number jumped out at me and it, it just seemed rather. It's, it's uh, 65001 on page G8. It's going up by $18,000 because of new phones, but the total bill is 150000 Is that part of the SCADA stuff? I, mean, I, I, I don't know what all is included in that. We do have a lot of SCADA. So we've got, uh, we've also, SCADA also includes wire too, right? So we've got some, uh, 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 we call it uh, the, uh, the optical stuff. Uh, Does telecommunication handle that stuff on the pole? They do. Okay. But we have, we have a lot of fees that go back and forth between us and telecom. Um, so this 150, though, but I think it's mostly, it's mostly all the services that we have, uh, SCADA and as well as these, right? So we have a fair amount of, of, uh, of, of uh, regular communications also with these phones. Okay. It just seemed like a lot, I guess. Coffee doing business, I guess. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, it says wireless. Telecommunication services, internet, long distance, and toll free numbers. Cell phones. How many cell phones are we paying? I have that on another sheet. <laughs> She's got it. <laughs> She's got it. It's actually on her cell phone. It's on the cloud. I just spend it. everybody's money for them. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. That's what Ed says anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, let's see, specifically in terms of electric cell phones. Yes, uh, theirs was one of the departments that did have an increase. Um, they had a lot of basic phones, the basic just flip phones, and by moving to the smartphones and adding data, they're increased. You need to look at this. That's 300 so it's 311 per month, so about $3,600 additional for, for wireless. The question was how many cell phones? Oh, how many cell oh, phones? Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of cell phones. 13. So who gets out of the cell phones? Yeah. Clearly the mayor should be getting out. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that 
also it looks like it includes a... That's just in the electric division? That's just the electric division. There's a tablet, um, there's a tablet and then 12 cell phones. And so there's meter shop, um, looks like the foreman, Andy, Mark, Jeremy. I think we can make a business just on KPUs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim, thank you. Well, we have 43 people, so the... I, I'm not arguing that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to share. <laughs> That's that on call phone that nobody to wants to touch. touch. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a real way of going. You were on telecommunications. <laughs> You're it. Telecommunications. Yeah, I'll a question. Yes. H3, uh, I think that's probably the objectives for 2017. And uh, first three items up there, $100,000 for new wireless at Metla Cattler, 300 for deployment of additional 4G LTE, and 300 for additional microwave equipment. Is there any idea at all what the recovery time is for that uh, $700,000? Do we put it out every year and never recover it, or...? No, it's, it's not a recurring expense, not all of it anyway. But I would look at the period that we've recouped our investment on the initial deployment of wireless. That was a $5 million offering, and what are you projecting for revenues for 2016? We talked about that the other day. Sure. Like everything else in telecom, nothing is simple. But we essentially invested roughly $5 million. Roughly half of that went to 4G LTE. The other half went to building the network down to uh, uh, Prince Rupert mm -hmm. and purchasing the IRU. The IRU and the microwave were incredibly important for two reasons. One, we could no longer afford to buy capacity from GCI. We were going to go out of business in about two years if we didn't do something else. So we utilized the IRU and the microwave to Canada to, in the, in the near term, increase our capacity to the lower 48 by a factor of 10 times for roughly the same amount that we were paying GCI. And now we own our own capacity. As well, we needed the capacity to the lower 48 in order to provide the off-island circuits down to Seattle to connect the new 4G LTE system. Otherwise, we couldn't afford to go into the business uh, because we couldn't afford the transport circuits down to Seattle. Relative to the two and a half million that we initially invested in the 4G LTE network, in three years, we've essentially gone from zero re annual revenue to this year, $2 million in annual revenue. Next year, roughly $2.5 million. So in three and a half years, from zero to $2.5 million in annual revenue, which is remarkable. Good. Uh, so next year, we plan to put uh, an antenna or really a micro, I don't want to say micro, but a new node over in Malacala. One, so we can sell devices to people who live there, but most equally importantly, provide our coverage out over into uh, Clinton Straits and provide better marine coverage. The uh, decision to put a uh, radio up in Skagway was, has turned out extraordinarily well. We'll drive at least $500,000 in revenue out of Skagway next year with just one, one radio. Every year will we uh, invest some more money in, in micro cells to improve coverage in a particular part of town where we found a hole or something? Sure, that's the cost of doing business. Uh, but in the aggregate, the decision to invest the $5 million was incredibly important because we wanted to stay in business. Incredibly important because we need to have a wireless play. And most importantly, there's no question we're paying that loan back uh, every year from the revenue that we're driving in off the, the rise. So I don't know if that 
gets to the answer you're looking for. Well, I, I assume that a lot of the income is from data usage, just everybody streaming movies and everything else. And, and at some point in time, I can't believe that when do you get, when is there no more increase in um, usage or unless we're giving it away free and everybody's giving away more and more data usage, it goes up, which you can get free or cheaper anymore to the point that it seems like to me there's going to be a cap hit pretty quick. Well, there's two, two when I think about uh, data streaming, and you're, you're exactly correct, it's all about data that's being streamed over the network. There's two types. There's the data that we're roaming for Verizon. Every time a Verizon customer comes to town, they use their device, we get revenue. And there are two types of people, three types of customers generally doing that. Folks off the cruise ships and or off the airplanes who visit town. And then folks who move here from somewhere else and they already have a Verizon phone from somewhere else, they live here and they look like a roamer from a cruise ship or something that they're here. There's roughly uh, 700 devices in town every day throughout the winter that looks like a permanent roamer. It's really interesting. My wife moved here from Washington. She has a Verizon service pre-established. She's a permanent roamer. Good for us. That's a great revenue. So Verizon roamers, permanent roamers, the roamers that Remember, we get some roaming revenue for every device Kim's folks sell in the store as well. And then there's another type of streaming data, and that's the folks who have our IPTV service. Increasingly, I know some of you are guilty, people go home at night and they stream movies. That's putting a demand on our network, and that may be the part what you're talking about or referring to. Regarding the Verizon data, <coughs> Verizon has given us estimates on the year-over-year percentage increase that we should expect to see in the amount of data that's being driven in here from Romans. The numbers are kind of hard to believe when they offer them to you, but it's exactly what we've seen year over year. Um, why? Because four years ago, not everybody had a smartphone, so they weren't all streaming data. The, uh, as more and more folks uh, buy smart devices, just and visit us, they'll just put more and more traffic on our network. Where it all stops, I don't know. You know last year, you asked me if my uh, revenue budget estimate for 2016 was real, and I said, I hope so, and it turned out to be better than real. Next year, we've increased it by $500,000. I think we'll hit that. So there's that piece. Regarding the screening, the impact on our network, the people streaming movies and increasingly streaming more, uh, streaming more and more and more data on our network, where that stops, I don't know. And we're keeping up with it, but at some point we'll be having a budget conversation that goes like this. We need more network out by um, so. To add a question on that, so how far could we... I was just thinking that, just looking at the numbers, um, like POW, what other, no? No. The, the leading factor, or the primary limiter in our ability to go to a Sitka or anywhere right. else is the cost of leasing the circuits between here and there. Skagway, we were able to cut a really great deal with at and Okay. But we have explored... Puna, no, right. anywhere the cruise ships go, that's where we want to go. Cost of transport is too high. The cost for us to build it is too high. Too high. And you know, I'll get to share one interesting number with you. We get roughly a million tourists a year here, if you will. Cruise ship passengers, Sydney gets 120,000. Run the numbers. We can't make a system pay in Sydney. Or anywhere else, really. We're kind of saturated in our. Off-island potential. Yeah. Or out of but as Sitka builds more private docks, that number is going to go up. Yeah. Which there's a building yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the break-even part? Half a million, three quarters? Maybe? The cost we've been quoted for transport in the Sitka break-even. Oh, I, 
I didn't give you the full picture. There's the cost of transport, mm -hmm. and then there's the cost of building out the local network. You think it, said it would take about the same number of radios that it required us to invest here? So you're talking about another two and a half million dollars. I'm not sure where I'll get that at a much longer payback period. You won't get it. <laughs> Well, there you go. Let's, let's, get, the snap. let's get back to the budget. There's no economy to me having this budget. <laughs> Any other questions thank, on thank telecommunications? <laughs> That's okay. Let's get back to telecommunications, Dick. Uh, H6, um, it looks like you're eliminating two apprentice telecom people. I noticed in electric. Division. We're keeping our apprentice around. Uh, can you explain to me why we want to get rid of apprentice? The apprentice. We're not getting rid of the apprentices, although it appears that the apprentices are finally topping out. They've completed their their four plus years of, uh, of growth, accumulation of hours. So now they're becoming your money. So if we have an opening, we will look for apprentice again. Not in my not, lifetime. Not at this time. I mean, you're adding, to do that, you'd be adding positions. And I'm not in a position to recommend putting on two more two more people above and beyond the 42 that's currently budgeted. So how do we utilize apprentice again? Lose <laughs> journey. Councilmember Cruz, not trying to not respond, no, okay. but that's a question that might be more appropriate in the executive session relative to collective bargaining. Okay, okay. Because I, I think the main thing is that we're looking at having local people working locally here. When we use apprentice, we thought we could be able to get local people, and they stay. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, they come and go. You couldn't be happier with the two young people we hired locally that are now talking about. Yeah. I know who Excellent. they are, yeah. Excellent. More telecommunications questions if you have them. Or we jump to water. Okay, thank you. That's it. You can do water and drink. Good job, Makes it feel better. Blue? Yes. I'll oh, keep going. H7. Uh, okay. There's an item about oh, three items off the bottom. It says uh, an increase in account number 535-4 increased by 14 grand because of implementing a new uniform policy for KPU television telecommunication employees. I, I'm curious as to how many employees you're talking about. Is that everybody, just the people that hit the front desk or what? Do you want to respond to that? This is actually addressing uh, telecom network employees as opposed to customer service employees. Mm. We're, we're pursuing, basically, we intend to take our technicians to the next level as well as some of our other folks relative to the way they present in public. Anybody who works with the public, uh, we intend to put them in logo wear. Uh, quite frankly, I intend to send it out with coats that don't have IBW patches on them. Uh, you know, we need to be out representing our products in our company to the public, not uh, the colors of some other organization. We don't have that right now. So this is part and parcel of the uh, division-wide uh, logo, I'll call it logo wear dress uh, situation. So it's kind of coats and maybe vests or something. It's not to be to be defined as we work through that process. Okay. Your Honor. Yes. Um, just a question: Do the employees that go to the homes they have badges? No. Like I just read recently mm -hmm. on Facebook where somebody tried to get in a home here locally, yeah. saying mm -hmm. that they were an, an employee, yeah. not a KPU employee. I think they said they were a GCI employee. Yeah. Well, every that wasn't in. I remember that story, I recall, so it wasn't a KPU telecom employee, but uh, 
Yes, every employee of the division, including management, admin, we all have badges. badges. That are presented. Minus in my other co okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes. just check. There's an example in the back. Pardon? Is there an example in the back? There's one there. There's one here. Hey, Lou, where's your badge? Where's your badge? He didn't make badges for us. No. All right, anything else on telecommunication? Good, a little fun, right? Yeah, we're just Hey, let's go to water. Ready to go to capital? Okay, let's look at capital. It goes by division. forget we have a couple motions we need to make. Mm -hmm. Anything on capital? What exactly is the PENIC? K I A J. What's that? The PENIC K I A N A six. Oh, there go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. Cable, isn't it? Is Are they cable? replacing it or? Yeah. It's a catch can and extra airport upgrade. Oh, okay. That's the. Uh, okay. I always thought it was grouping. Yeah. Yes. 
C5, it's under pole replacement. I know that we've been doing that every year. Andy, do you know that if the contractor's coming in that's going to do the South Congress, I heard they're going to bring in a drill system to sink poles in. Uh, have you heard anything about that? So maybe we can take advantage of that uh, if, if need be. Let me ask Mark. We have details on that. Are you referring to the North Tongass Street Line yeah. project? I think that's what it is. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're going to be uh, drilling and uh, excavating for the uh, for the bases for those lights. Um, but I don't I don't see any any advantage to taking advantage of that. The, the crews that come into town, they're going to, they have their mini excavators, and then the digger derricks have arms on them for uh, drilling the holes and the holes, the line crews themselves. I thought I heard that somewhere they're going to bring in a rock drill for that to drill the hole. So, uh, uh, probably. I imagine they're going to, they're bound to see some rock. Yeah, okay. um, a lot of the rock augers on some of the some of the diggers, ours in particular, can, can grind rock. Okay. And then if we have to, I just wondered if there was any coordination there that would be to our daddy. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just, just so I'm, I'm sure about this number. So we're looking at replacing 100 poles over the next four years for $2 million? Is that what we're looking at? Or is it We've got roughly 4,000 poles in the whole system. Right. And it says 400 need, need replacement. Yeah, it's, 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 it's approximate. We, there, there was a... A company came through maybe 10 years ago or so and did some assessments um, and identified some at various rankings, and it's been 10 years since, and we're still picking away at that. Um, some of them are cedar, but just because it's cedar, you know, some of them you look at them, they look horrible. You stick a knife into them, it's just shell rod, and, and, the, cord, and the cores are still um, pretty solid. But we're aiming, uh, the contractor this, this year, 2016, did roughly 25 poles. Um, In-house crews did. 10, 15 or so, so we've got 40 done in 2016, and that's, that seems to be it. Okay, so this number here that includes in-house and contractor poles. Yeah, okay. yeah it does. Yeah. Yep, Mark, real yes. quick, yep. $14,000 a pole? Uh, I think this year we were seeing 17000 17000 Yeah, pole. and it's variable. We've been putting the contractors on some of the more complicated poles, uh, angles and double circuits, and try to throw them the, the real messy ones. What, 400 of them, that's a lot of money. Yes, it is. <laughs> By the way, my light's working great. What's that? My light's working great. Yeah. It's been a whole week. Oh, you know, it turns out you, you had 11 for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so. Happy mayor is a good thing. That's right. Now there's vocals. one on 3rd Avenue. <laughs> it never ends. Yeah, it never ends. Because when these are all done, there'll be 400 more left. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's true. If you keep the strut real tight, they put the holes break. It's not a problem. Just kind of waving. It's so damn raven. <laughs> While we're waiting, um, if you have any questions, I did finish the um, uh, the committee's things. I'll have that to the clerk tomorrow, and she can email it out to everybody. They've done something. <laughs> Mayor Hoyer, Hoyer is waiting yeah. and looking uh, on C7. How many of those uh, AMI type meters or automatic meters do we get for 140 grand? At 90 grand, that's six years worth. Okay. And maybe the other figure you want to know is we're about 66 percent deployed right now. Yeah, I was just looking at it. Says you got about 2,300 meters to go, and 
Yes. And I don't think that we're ever going to get fully deployed. I think maybe the right number is probably around 80% deployed AMI, and then the rest are going to need a meter here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, my numbers are right, 400 for my user. Any other questions? You guys want to make some motions on the first um, two um, budget updates, number one and number two? Yeah, I move the City Council amend the 217 KPU budget by decreasing the 216 estimate for the raw fish tax payment by $54,429 and decreasing the 217 projected for the raw fish tax payment by $40,200. Second. Put in second. Anybody want to speak to it? Call the roll. Yes. Piper? Yes. Piper? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Severson? Yes. Yeah, this is passes six to nothing. That brings us down to number two, um, operating capital budget update carryover of 2016 capital projects. Your Honor, I move the City Council approve the carryover of $15,000 of the Electric Division's Bailey Diesel Generator number three. Is that, is that bag three? Is that the? Bag three. Bag, three. bag three. Yeah. Boy, I feel. I learned something. <laughs> Bag 3 asbestos abatement capital project program for 2016 and authorize the general manager to add the project to the 2017 Ketchikan Public Utilities operating capital budget and reduce the capital project originally programmed for 2016 by 15000 Do we have a second? second? Moved and seconded. Do we want to talk to it? Call the roll. Sievertson? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Coos? Yes. Zingy? Yes. That passes six to nothing. Those are the two. We also have the um, motion on the um, rates. Um, I think I'd like to address that on Thursday when we do our finish and final. Um, Since Mark's not going to be here probably that day either after we go to town, I might have to vote on something, so mm -hmm. okay. I have some questions yet. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to talk to about the KPU budget? <coughs> yeah, Lou, one more question. Yes. Um, C-15, it talks about downtown underground upgrades and the first sentence is ADOT's front mill Stedman project will take place in 2017 which will not allow KPU to undertake any major upgrades in the downtown underground electrical circuits is there something we need to do before they tear that road up and we have to tear it up again to fix it no, our conduit systems in, under the road are in pretty good shape. This is just referring to switches and transformers that are in the vaults. Okay. And we're just going to stay out of the area unless unless something oh, okay. unless something urgent comes up. We're not okay. going to look at replacing any major equipment in there. This year. Okay. Thank you. Carl, did you get an um, update on that, Mike? Thing about Thomas Basin and the sewer thing. I'm hoping to have something for you Thursday night. Thank you very much.
better? Yes. Ed, um, under D9, we're talking about, you know, the fiber to the home. How are we doing on that? I mean, uh, what part of the, how much of the community are we serving now by fiber to the home? We, uh, we have fiber to the curb throughout essentially 100% of the community. To serve your home, of course, takes an extending a fiber service drop to your home yeah. or to your business. We have right at 2,000 uh, individual homes on fiber today, customers, 2,000 customers served by fiber. Um, we sent in essentially every new install that we do on fiber. Um, and we are pretty close to finished with our fiber to the business project, which is something we started doing, uh, implemented a couple of years ago. <clears throat> um, which means we either have fiber into every business in town or we can be there in 30 days to, to run in this, the cable. So we're doing pretty darn well. We still have work to do relative to doing uh, in, buying and installing the modules say that go into a condominium complex because we can't run 40 individual fibers say in the condo where I live so we put in one of these multi-dwelling units or yeah. MDUs uh, but, but so my answer to your question is we've done really really well we don't have every customer on fiber but uh, we the customers we have that really need fiber higher bandwidth folks people who have multiple TV sets in their homes etc Everybody who needs fiber has fiber. But in our long range goal is that everyone will be on fiber. That, that's so when does this transition from a capital project to an operational thing? Could just like managing other drops? Well before I retire. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know that I, I mean I, I don't know if because you always have some. Yeah. But we don't what we don't have anymore except for a random new subdivision or something is is uh, a big capital budget for running fiber ca uh, cables down streets because that's not that's complete. We just have what I would call a maintenance capital budget now for fiber for something that might come up. But is that something that should transition over to operations? Because really, is at some point. At some point, it's just service drops, but yeah. you still, we still capitalize the activity if it's running new service drops. Okay. This is more of an accounting thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Ed, while you're there, uh, yes, on D26, it talks about uh, Wi-Fi in the, in the downtown area, and it, it says that um, Wi-Fi nodes, Wi-Fi, nodes will provide KPU customers with a virtually seamless Wi-Fi roaming downtown. What's that mean to me? Can I can I go downtown and get on Wi-Fi and not cost me nothing, or are we going to charge the tourists, or how does it work? No, I think that virtually uh, seamless phrase is an unfortunate term of art that somebody named Ed Cushing put in the budget a few years ago and didn't change. Okay. Uh, we continue to invest in new Wi-Fi nodes, but that's primarily in individual businesses. We've walked away from this notion of providing a seamless, you know, area. Okay, and yeah. businesses that offer it to customers coming in? For the most part, yes. Okay. In some cases, they okay. cut the system in half, part of it's for them, part of it's for okay. resale. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? He had left too quick. He just wanted to say that. He just waited and sat down. Yeah. I was watching. You were doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm here to serve. Video set top boxes is the the ones we have now um, pretty stable and, and really staying with those pretty much. I know they're yeah. one of those odds. As, as you recall, there was a period of time where set top boxes were really paying for top of the yes. my, my answer to your question is yes, the ones we use today are generally pretty pretty darn good. Um, and we're pretty happy with them. But we're constantly going to be in this process of as the technology evolves, as the middleware evolves, we'll, we'll always be going to the next, you know, the next best amino or whatever, whatever it is. It's just the 
nature of the business. Well, and the reason why I asked, I think there was some, some stuff done, and then the particular box like I have, it doesn't communicate as well as it did under the old middleware programming, whatever it was. And I just don't know that if this is going to be an ever-evolving situation with our middleware providers. Or if I had my telecom crystal ball here, <laughs> I would say, and I, 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 part of me truly hopes this becomes the case, as the world becomes more and more all IP, we, we may very well evolve away from what you and I recognize as set-top boxes. We may evolve away from the great big head end out at Telcom, um, where in which we bring all these signals in and reconvert them and send them out. We may end up just getting virtually all of our video content out of the cloud, and you'll have an Apple, uh, a Roku, or what have you. I, I think that's the direction we're headed, and that's subject to. I mean, we have that debate internally uh, all the time, but I think that's, that's probably where we're headed. Ultimately, is a less hard-intensive business. Get used to every two years upgrading. Really yeah. yeah. it, it, it doesn't work right for having yeah. to you understand it. So I'll, eventually, I'll be under one big right. computer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You'll yeah. go out and be <laughs> 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 I should be hooked right in. Just get your own chip. Yeah, hey, we'll, we'll download that. <laughs> Mr. Newell, can I ask you a question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> budget question? Yeah. I mean, now we're talking about the um, water rate at 5.5. What's that in dollar amounts for um, residential? Going to increase it from fifty-two dollars and five cents per month to fifty-four dollars and ninety-two cents per month. Okay, and then under wastewater, what did we recommend for that in the last one? That was a six percent rate increase, and that will increase the residential wastewater rate from four dollars to forty-nine dollars and ninety-eight cents per month to fifty-two dollars and ninety-eight cents per month. Okay. And I some other questions here on the um, on the processing thing, but I'll give you a buzz tomorrow on that. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Lou, Dick, well, Bob, while you're, here, while you're there, when uh, the gentleman from uh, Phillips was there, he talked about their rates going up by so much in total. He, and he talked about the other processors pretty much going down. How... Uh, can we get some feeling as to why that happened? Yeah, I can get some information for you. That, that is correct. Uh, yes. Some will go up and some will go down. And you will, Bob, and you will have the numbers for us on just what that increase would mean for Phillips so we can say. Sure, I will. All right. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I, just a bit. I, I tried to ask this question when, when the woman was doing your presentation, and I know I didn't ask it correctly because I didn't get, didn't get the answer I, was, I, I thought I could get. Um, assuming, you know, I have to assume that the projected what we're going to make off these new rates is not based on the fact that if we raise the processor's rates beyond a certain level, they cut way back. So I asked him, what? I, 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 I mean, we don't, we don't know for sure how much they're going to cut back, but I have to assume if I raise someone's rates 60%, they're going to cut back drastically. So we can't assume that we're going to get that additional 60% off their basic rates. Right. And I tried to ask that when she was here, and I didn't ask it right because I didn't get an answer that made, made sense. So I guess I'm curious as how much, maybe you can have this information for us on Thursday, how much of the, of, of the projected rate structure is based on the assumption they won't cut back. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. Okay. I do know that we have been increasing the rate by 8% per mm -hmm. year for the last three right. years. And what some of the process we did, if they went back and took an inventory of yeah. the number of lines they had, yeah. and they actually dropped. And they cut back, yeah. Right. Um, if we go to a, a metered rate structure, it might be kind of difficult to get arms around that number because mm -hmm. we really don't know for sure how much volume the, the process is will use. Mm -hmm. But um, I can show you what to do having a bone okay. system and what they have done. Okay. One, one more. Bob. 
Sorry. What, what, just, just to talk to Dave a little bit. Um, we're not intending to try to balance the budget on the rates of the fish processes. What we're trying to do is balance them between rate classes. Right, right now, our, our residential customers are paying more than the service that they're getting in regards to volumes. And so that's, that's what the study was about, is, is how do you spread that out? And it's been in disparity for so many years, it's hard to catch up in a short period. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I'm just, it, it, it's, it's the law of diminished returns. If you raise something too dramatically, over, even over a, a five-year period, and they drop usage, then we're, we're actually back where we started because we're not getting what we thought we were going to get. And so like I said, I, I see to understand before I vote on that, you know, what, what we're looking at. Dick? So. Yeah, um, I guess a couple of questions or comments. One is, can we get a running tally of what the processors have done over the last say, three years since we started increasing rates? Has their metered water gone down? Can we get this? Somebody can provide us, I'm sure, mm -hmm. what it's dropped. But, and the other one, if it is indeed true, but I don't know whether I believe this is right or not, that According to him, 2%, and this was from our figures, only 2% of our operating costs is related to treatment of water. So we could, and that's, I think that's the way I heard it coming across of our total budget. Only 2% of it's related to the amount of water. And if that's the case, maybe we've got way too low a figure on the size of pipes. And maybe instead of a rate per gallon, the rate per size of pipe goes like that. And that's exactly what is happening. If you go back and look at the rate structure that FCF put together, the larger the pipe, the more you pay. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's got to go up even more if we, if we are worried about the rate per gal thousand mm -hmm. gallons as being a problem. Anyway, thought. Go ahead, Alan, and Bob. It'd be kind of interesting to see what the what the actual cost is with Washington. I don't know if that could be found out about Canada, you know, when they ship it out. Because I know Washington has meter rates. And I know their cost of living or I mean we can make an attempt, that might go a bit challenging. Yeah, just out of our water rates aren't that bad, yeah. man. I mean and, and I know that they're like um, I you know, uh, what they're giving their employees now has gone up it's substantially, so due to the income raises. So. A lot of that stem was built up because we had low water rates and low power yeah. rates. Um, you know, we don't want to turn away um, business, so we got to be uh, right. smart and how we set it. All right, anybody else of you guys want to go home? We'll have Thursday to um, the budget will be back on the table. We'll talk about these rates or not. Um, I don't know if I'm informed or not, the, uh, but I'll be asking questions. Um, I'm trying to think we'll probably have some budget updates. And I thought I had something else and I can't remember. Real quick question you for, for Carl and Bob. So we had more or less an agreement with them processor for eight percent a year for three or three years or something like that yes so that's done correct yep okay we gave them three years to do what they could to get their water conservation and stuff done yeah right? okay and but we don't want to go i mean some of the higher rates like petersburg you can see their rates and that discouraged them from doing stuff there yeah. they're up in the hundred dollars so um mayor council comments stick um no. Judy? No comments. Jenna Lee? No. Julie? Nothing. Bob? I'd like to thank staff for their work on the budget. Thank you. Dave? You did all that, but no other comments. Thank you. <laughs> um, damn it. I put the piece of paper in there, and I had written the things on the side what to do, and now I'm, or what to, I had questions on to bring up to you guys. So you went out. I'll find out on Thursday. Um, I have nothing. Um, like I say, we'll take up in the budget. How? What's the agenda look like? I haven't even looked at it, Carl. It's very general. There were a couple items that might 
generate some discussion. Okay. <laughs> I better look. My couple can generate some discussion. Yeah. In other words, have your best game. Yeah. <laughs> Bring your best game. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Yeah, right. We'll adjourn. Um,